I'm wandering around looking for this book. It's right here in front of me. Greetings. It is I, the great one himself, Cynical Libertarian Society, C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com, on the interwebs. Welcome to the new era of Obama, after the election where the Republicans took the House and the Senate. Can't wait to read about how the Democrats explain how this means that the people love Obama more than ever. They love Obama so much they voted Republican. The great thing about this election was that the Democrats lost control of the House and the Senate. They only had one of those, but whichever, they lost seats in both. The bad thing about this election is, of course, that the Republicans gained control and gained seats in the House and the Senate. The other bad part, of course, is that I'm surrounded by dipshits who not just are slaves, but actually want to be slaves. Welcome to an anarchy moment. I got a list here of little things I want to cover. And God help me, even though there is no God. If there was a God, I would hope that God would help me out. Next week, I'm going to get back on track, picking up where I left off, talking about women. Let's talk about this real quick, though. So, in the previous two editions of Stating the Obvious, whichever they are, I am talking about this series of girls from personal experience and their shitty behavior. As I was looking at my notes today, I realized I had another girl I needed to add to the list. I think it's fascinating that in recent times I have interacted with and gone out with so many girls and can barely remember some of them, except when I think really hard. And I find that fascinating because I know that you women out there think that you are so special and you're so unforgettable that men desire you for like the rest of their lives, right? Like some man goes out with you and you chose not to go out with him again and so you lied and you stood him up and all that sort of stuff. And in your tiny little brains, you think that for the rest of his life, he thinks about you and wants you because you're so fucking special. And the truth is, speaking as a man, I can tell you that, and I don't go out with a lot of women, even with the very limited number of women that I go out with, a couple of days after I don't see you anymore, I can barely even remember what you look like or what your name is. So you might want to get over that. Another interesting thing, in my series, I'm talking about the girls and I gave them letters to distinguish them and also because I didn't want to use real names. But girl number D the one whom I said was the only one who had any integrity and told me she had a boyfriend and just said she didn't want to go out with me instead of lying to me and saying, yes, I would go out with, I'll go out with you and then standing me up, which is what every other woman did, which is, again, comes back to women do not have integrity. Women cannot be moral agents. Women are not agents, and this is why women should not hold positions of responsibility. It's why they shouldn't be in the workplace. It's why when they are in the workplace, they should only have low-level jobs, because they are all, almost all, liars. I ran into girl D again today. I said hi to her. It was cool. I said, how's it been? You know, whatever. And she looked slightly terrified because, you know, God forbid somebody fucking speak to her because you women these days are all so fucking fragile that somebody just talks to you. And this is the most terrifying thing that can happen to you. You're so scared. Because, of course, feminism and femistatism and the state and the colleges and all this have taught you to be so fucking terrified of everything. Because, of course, the state and the corporations want you to be a victim. 
because I have talked about this ad nauseum about how women who are not victims do not serve the purpose of the state. And of course, so many of you have bought into this victimhood shit that just being spoken to by another person in broad daylight in a public place just terrifies the shit out of you fucking cunts. So anyhow, I saw a girl B and I said, hi, what's up? And I kind of walked away. And I thought about it, I said, all right, you know, do I pursue this? I got another opportunity. Do I hit her up again? Because she's still pretty fucking hot. Do I work it? And then I just decided to go back to reading my book. Because she just wasn't worth the effort. Which brings me to, I want to read a paragraph from a blog by Cappy Cap. Aaron Clary, Captain Capitalism. If I remember, I'll put a link to this in the show notes. And he's talking about how, it's a post he's writing about how women are pointing at men in the Men Going Their Own Way movement, or MGTOW for short, which I'm not any particular fan of the MG. What is it, MGTOW movement or whatever the fuck it is. I don't particularly have any association with this or care about this or anything else. But it is what it is. And it's men who are just like saying, hey, honey, shut the fuck up. You know, we don't necessarily need you to make our lives complete and all this other stuff. You know, it's sort of this equivalent thing to... It is, as far as I know, and I haven't delved into it because, again, I just I don't give a shit about movements whether they're homosexual movements or feminist movements or men's movements or student movements or communist, it just the whole movement thing, I mean, that in and of itself is collectivism. I just don't give a flying fuck about movements, unless it's my bowel movement. I enjoy those. Good bowel movement is pretty fucking enjoyable. Anyhow, so I don't know a lot about this movement and I don't give a fuck about this movement. But my impression is that the men going their own way is sort of this movement of men who are saying a man needs a woman like a fish needs a bicycle. And Aaron is writing that a lot of femistatists get all worked up whenever they see a member of the MGTOW. God, I fucking hate this shit. You know, it's the LGBTNY9Z slash, the, it's the MGTOW movement, wherever the fuck it is. It's a, they're probably a bunch of guys who sit around the forest and bang drums or some shit and sing Kumbaya. I don't fucking know. I don't fucking care. The point is, Aaron is writing about how when femistatists see a member of this MGTOW movement with a woman, and they're like, oh, look, see, you're claiming you don't need women, but here you are with a woman. And Aaron points out that that's because life is not binary, which is hilarious because, of course, the LGBT movement is entirely about how there is no sexual binary. Aaron points out that men never entirely throw off, that's my terminology, women. And it's true, men, no matter how old they are, in my opinion, in my experience, and based on my personal life and based on my male friends, men never entirely lose interest in women. But they do certainly lose interest in women. Especially as women become less interesting and more fragile and more sensitive and stupider, which we'll talk about in a minute, and more fucked up. So I'm going to read you this paragraph from Aaron's blog. The point is, so sorry ladies, so terribly sorry. MGTOW is not like becoming a born-again Christian, quitting drugs cold turkey, or joining AA. It's not a yes or no, 
an either or, a one or zero. It's the sad reality that men are making logical and economic choices as to how to spend their finite time and putting women down further and further in terms of life's priorities when history and empirical data show they don't provide an adequate rate of return. However, women are rarely kicked off the list completely. And therefore, when you see a MGTOW on a date getting some play or has some broad on the back of his motorcycle, he isn't a fraud or a hypocrite. He's a guy living his own life on his terms and still slaying it with the ladies. And Aaron's completely right about this. I mean, I looked at girl D today and saw that she's a good solid, she's still a good solid 7, 7.5, really fucking hot, fantastic ass, great legs, fin, good arms, nice long blonde hair. And I thought about where did I want to spend my finite time that I have on the planet Earth? And I decided that I wanted to spend that time reading a book because the book I'm reading right now which I'm going to read a couple of passages from in a minute is really fucking good and the rate of return on reading this book was higher than the expected rate of return talking to this girl Speaking of stupid, went out for a beer with a friend of mine. She is a scientist, works at a research lab, and they have some undergraduate student employees working there. And whenever we get together, she and I usually bitch about how stupid kids are these days. And... <laughs> She's only 30, so she's not exactly fucking, you know, ancient and tells stories about when she was your age, she had to walk uphill, but still. Here's her latest story. I told one of her stories before, this was the great one, where she's on campus. My friend, is. we'll call her Alice. Alice is on campus, and there's a freshman walking around, and Alice walks, and the freshman is with a map and looking lost. So Alice goes up to the freshman and says, can I help you find anything? And the girl says, well, I'm trying to figure out my map, and I think I may don't know which way north is. And so Alice says, well, here in Colorado, all you got to do is look for the mountains. you know, Or rather, I should say here in Fort Collins. Depends exactly where you are in Colorado. Here in Fort Collins, just look for the mountains. Whichever way the mountains are, you know that's west. And the little freshman girl with 12 years of public education looks at my friend Alice and says, okay, so then which way is north? Because 12 years of public education, if you know which way west is, you would think a person would be able to deduce from knowing that which way is north. You would be wrong because public education. The story of today from my friend Alice is that she's working in a lab, working in the lab, with a undergraduate student and the undergrad is getting some equipment out and the undergrad has 21 pieces of this equipment and the undergrad has 12 pieces of this equipment and she needs to have 21 pieces of both and so she's like well I only have 12 of these I don't know how many I need and Alice says well do subtraction and so the undergrad thinks for a minute and he says well is it eight? Because for those of you who didn't, it's a word problem, I get it, and I'm you know, talking and shit. You have 21, let's say you have 21 Petri dishes, and you have 12 Petri dish lids. How many more Petri dish lids do you need in order to have one lid for each Petri dish? Well, you would take 21 and you would subtract 12 and that would tell you how many additional lids you need. So this undergraduate, 12 years of public education, some odd years worth of college, 
does the math in her head, 21 minus 12, and comes up with 8. So my friend Alice says, no, that's wrong. Try again. And the undergrad attempts again in her head without using a calculator or her cell phone to subtract 12 from 21 and for the second time comes up with 8. Even after being told that 8 was the incorrect answer, she still comes up with 8. And of course, you women wonder, this was a girl, if I didn't mention it, the undergrad who can't do math is a girl. You women wonder why you can't find a good man. You wonder why you don't get paid the same amount of money men do. You wonder why people like me come on these podcasts and make fun of you. You wonder why men are only interested in you for your vagina. You wonder why reading a book is more important to men than talking to women. You wonder why men are not interested in spending part of their finite life with you. You wonder why men are losing interest in getting married. I don't know, I'm just saying it could possibly this is only a thesis, but it could possibly, in some remote way, be related to your inability to subtract 12 from 21. Speaking of self-involved women, I am still listening to the audiobook of Catching Fire, the second book in the Hunger, Bo Hunger Games series, if I can talk correctly. It's pretty good. There's still a lot, of course, of the same internal dialogue and endless exposition and yada, yada, yada. The one thing I'll add at this point is I've just got to the part where apparently we're having another round of Hunger Games. And I'm thinking to myself, is this really the best the author could come up with? Right, because in the book, so Katniss is back, she's back in District 12. And certain things happen that lead her to gather the knowledge that there are revolts going on in other districts and yada, yada, yada. And then, oh, by the way, there's spoilers here if you haven't seen the movie or read the book. And then they announced that for the 75th Hunger Games, all of the tributes will be selected from previous winners of the Hunger Games. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is clearly the point where Katniss should focus on instigating the rebellion, right? Leading the rebellion, organizing the rebellion, starting the rebellion, overthrowing the capital city. But then, of course, without the capital, well, who would build the roads? And I was expecting that to happen, and instead they very rapidly fast forward, and now suddenly we're about to have another round of Hunger Games. I don't know, I feel like we've been here before. We've been here before. Is this... We've done this already. We've already had a fucking round of Hunger Games. I'm... It would be, I, I was going to say I'm hoping, but as I've said before, hoping is not a fucking process. I don't know, I just feel like a good author would not give us another dose of Hunger Games. But we'll see what happens. I'm sticking with it. Even though it's a lot of whiny-ass internal dialogue and 
pity party and all this other shit. Speaking of pity parties, you need to throw yourself a, I wouldn't say a pity party. Last week, I worked a lot. Did a lot of hours doing physical shit. I was tired. This is the second of two days off that I've had. It's 8 o'clock at night now, as you may have heard from the chiming. Things are coming to a close. But in the last two days, I got some downtime. Ate some nutritious food for a change. Yesterday, I went trail running and listened to a Hunger Games disc. Today, I went bicycling and trail running and listened to another Hunger Games disc. Sunshine, fresh air, exercise, good food, right? You know, taking care of the old body. Just a reminder out there, my friends, that especially in a lot of the businesses that I'm in, the theater, the event gig, stuff like this, there's a lot of people out there who like to make a big deal out of why well, I worked, you know, 17 hours a day every day for the last month. And they say this shit like they're a hero. My friends, there's a time and a place to push yourself and work long days and get shit done. But the thing is, you should not be doing that on a regular basis. Because if you have to consistently work 15 hour days to get shit done, that means you really suck at planning. It means you suck at what you're doing. Because being a hero isn't working really long hours to get something done. Right? Being a hero is being able to get the job done and done well in a reasonable amount of time, especially so that you can walk away from the job and recharge yourself, recharge your batteries. Get downtime, enjoy your life, spend some time with your friends, eat good food, exercise, fresh air, sunshine. Do all the things you need to rejuvenate your mind, your body, your spirit, all the things you need to do to be healthy because if you have the healthy mind, the healthy body, the healthy spirit, you can don't go in and you can do your job better. So all of this, I worked 15 hours a day every day for the last three weeks. I'm such a hero. No, you're not a hero. You're a fucking idiot because if you are good at what you're doing, you wouldn't need to work that much. You would be able to do what you need to do and then get some time for yourself. Because again, remember, the amount of time you have here on the planet Earth is finite. It's very finite. That's why you've got to make choices. Do you read a book? Or do you talk to a girl? Or do you watch animated Star Trek? So I've been watching the animated Star Trek episodes, the original Star Trek. Some of you out there may not even know this existed. After original Star Trek was canceled, it was brought back for a brief time. I don't know exactly how long. You could find it on the internet. Everything's on the internet. You could find it. It was brought back as an animated series. And I've been watching those, got them from Netflix, watching it just for the fun of it while I'm eating. As I mentioned before, my TV time is usually while I'm eating is when I watch television. I can tell you that the animated Star Trek series is pretty fucking terrible. They're, they're really bad. Holy shit, are they bad. Really bad. You know what else is bad? I am catching up on podcasts and I've been catching up on some Ben Stone podcast. There's been some really good ones. Listened to a couple recently with Jeffrey Tucker, which is always fun. Jeffrey Tucker's a pretty interesting guy. Hang on, I need water. That was my water bottle. If you listen to this show on a regular basis, you know. I have really good things to say about Ben Stone. He's a genius. 
I enjoy his podcast. He's a great thinker. But yet again, he said the one thing he always says that makes me wonder what the fuck he's smoking. Ben Stone yet again came forth and said that we, anarcho-capitalist, we people who believe in freedom, are winning. That more and more people are believing in freedom. I just don't know what the fuck he's smoking. I don't know who he's talking to, but living in a college town surrounded by people ages 18 to 22, I can tell you that freedom is not winning. These fucking kids want nothing more than to have their lives and their existence you know, controlled by the corporations and the government. They absolutely are totally okay with being strip searched at airports. They're perfectly okay with the corporations tracking their movement. They're completely okay with the government reading their email and listening to their phone calls. They're completely okay with all of their healthcare needs going through the government. They're completely okay with the wars in foreign countries. I mean, these people are, we, 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 those of us who believe in freedom, even if you're not full-fledged ANCAP, you know, we are not winning. I do not know where Ben Stone gets this shit, but I think he needs to fucking get out of his fucking RV and go somewhere besides Porkfest and just actually talk to some people, especially the young ones, this, the fucking stupid college kids who are the quote-unquote future of America, and he will very quickly find out that this is one thing he is very, very wrong about. We are not winning. Let me now close this by reading from a book, the book, in fact, that was more important than the incredibly hot girl that I ran into today and could and possibly even should have chatted up again just to see if she's changed her mind about going out. But I just didn't care, man. I mean, it's... I'm here. I'm on the planet Earth. I'm going to die one day. And talking to this girl is just, it's not worth it. It's becoming less and less worth it as every day goes by because the return on investment for interacting with women, I mean, they're all so fucking stupid and shallow. I mean, 21 minus 12. How fucking hard is that? Fucking 21 minus 12. How in the fuck do you get eight? And then after you're told that eight is the wrong answer, how do you come up with eight a second time? And the answer, of course, is 12 years of public education, having a mother, having a woman, rather, for your mother, and going to college, and being smartest generation ever, and having a cell phone, and having everything on Google. Women, it, they're, they're just less and less worth the investment. This book that I'm reading is Last and First Men by Olaf Stapledon. And I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. This is a very famous science fiction story, novel, book, which has been sitting on my shelf for a long time. I finally decided to get around to reading it because I wanted some more science fiction in my life right now. His name is O-L-A-F, I'm pronouncing it Olaf, probably wrong, Stapledon, S-T-A-P-L-E-D-O-N. Highly recommended. As I said, this is considered a classic. This book was written in, let me find this so I don't lie to you. Last and First Men was published in 1931, after World War One, before World War II. So what this book is, it's essentially sort of a future history type thing, where he starts with World War One, and he tells this story, which is a historical overview of 
the future of the human species far, 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 far into the future. You know, and again, so it's imagine yourself, whatever, you know, two billion years in the future, whatever, and you're reading the history of the human species. And so that's essentially what it is. And it's really interesting. So as I'm reading through this, he's, of course, like I said, it was written after World War I. World War I is in the book, and it's fairly accurate. But then after that, he starts, of course, creating a fictitious history, fictitious wars and events and everything else. And I just want to read. There's three sections in here I marked. I just want to read. And this book is not, you know, he's not trying to predict the future. He's writing a story. So he's not trying to predict the future. He's not trying to be political. At least I don't think he is. This is my interpretation. I wasn't there with him reading his mind while he did it. But I don't think he's trying to predict the future. Although it says on here that he is a British philosopher. So maybe in a way, through because he's a philosopher, maybe in a way he was trying to make some predictions. But the point is, it's a work of fiction. You don't need to take it seriously. But he's, there's some stuff he writes in here which is shockingly accurate of the way things develop have developed, are developing, are right now. And I just want to read a few of these to you, if I can find them. Here we go. So in his future, England and France go into essentially sort of a, a World War II. There's actually two wars. World War II doesn't happen. There's a war between Italy and France, and then there's a war between France and England, which leaves Germany as the superpower in Europe. Later on, there's additional wars, of course, including one that destroys most of Europe, but all that is irrelevant. So this passage I'm reading to you has taken place after France and England have gone to war with each other, and due to, and it, it is interesting in his, in this book, how his wars, I can't believe 30 fucking minutes I've been doing this. I could have just done an episode of Staying the Obvious. It's interesting that in his book, there's a lot of the sort of bullshit science that one expects from a science fiction novel written in this time period. But then it's also kind of interesting how his wars last for like a week because, oh, both sides were devastated so quickly. It's like, dude, I do not know what you're smoking. But the last time we had a war that lasted a week was the Six-Day War. And that's pretty much about it in the entire fucking history of warfare. Because, of course, the state is stupid. The state doesn't admit defeat. The state will always be able to take resources away from other people and turn those resources into weapons in a desperate attempt to kill other people. Anyhow, I'm just at this point I'm just fucking rambling. So let me just shut the fuck up and read to you the brilliance. Here we go. Here's passage number 1. Subsequently, it was Germany that spoke for Europe, and Germany was too serious an economic rival for America to be open to her influence. Moreover, German criticism, though often emphatic, was too heavily Pedatic, pedatic, That's my that's my attempts at pronunciation. Too little ironical to pierce the hide of American complacency. As I'm reading this passage to you, think about how well this describes the United States in the year 2014. This is what we're getting to. I continue reading now. Uh, thus it was that America sank further and further into Americanism. Vast wealth and industry, and also brilliant invention, were concentrated upon puerile ends. In particular, the whole of American life 
was organized around the cult of the powerful individual, uh, that phantom ideal which Europe herself had only begun to outgrow in her last phase. Uh, those Americans who wholly failed to realize this ideal, who remained at the bottom of the social ladder, either consoled themselves with hopes, hopes for the future, or stole symbolic satisfaction by identifying themselves with some popular star, or gloated upon their American citizenship and applauded the arrogant foreign policy of their government. Those who achieved power were satisfied so long as they could merely retain it and advertise it uncritically in the, in the conventionally self-assertive manners. The cult of the powerful individual. <laughs> oh, whoa. <laughs> Applauded the arrogant foreign policy of their government. Tell me, my friends, does all of that not sound... Oh, Steve Jobs, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Peyton Manning, blah, blah. Oh, Beyonce, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Obama. Blah, 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 blah. Does that passage, my friends, does that not remind you? Does that, that not perfectly describe the filthy, nasty little statist who crawl around us every fucking day? Here comes your next passage, as soon as I can find it. Mm, here we go. Now this is after the war in which America, the United States, devastates Europe. But the most lasting agony of this war was suffered not by the defeated, but by the victors. For when their passion had cooled, the Americans could not easily disguise from themselves that they had committed murder. They were not at heart a brutal folk, but rather kindly. They like to think of the world as a place of innocent pleasure-seeking and of themselves as the main purveyors of delight. Yet they had been somehow drawn into this fantastic crime and henceforth, henceforth an all-pervading sense of collective guilt warped the American mind. They had ever been vain, glorious, and intolerant. But now these qualities in them became extravagant even to insanity. Both as individuals and collectively, they became increasingly frightened of criticism, increasingly prone to blame and hate, increasingly self-righteous, increasingly hostile to critical intelligence, increasingly superstitious. Frightened of criticism, prone to blame and hate, self-righteous, hostile to critical intelligence and superstitious. Have you ever heard a better description of the statist? But, but who will build the roads? Final passage that I'm going to read to you as soon as I find it. So in this future history, and this is actually exactly what and I'm, I'm only so far in the book. I'm only on page 48. 
but at this point in the future history, the existing superpowers are China and the United States, which is mm, exactly what I've also predicted, is that we will end up with China and the United States being the only superpowers, and at some point, China, as I've said, when the United States falls, and the United States will collapse, China will become the last remaining superpower. And I'm dropping my fucking bookmark. Hold on. All right, let me see if I can find this passage. Read this and close this so you don't have to keep listening to my fucking rambling. Hmm, here we go. Again, tell me that this does not perfectly describe where we are right now. China, owing to her relative weakness and irritation caused by the tentacles of American industry within her, was at this time more nationalistic than her rival. America, indeed, professed to have outgrown nationalism and to stand for political and cultural world unity. But she conceived this unity as a unity under American organization. And by culture, she meant Americanism. This kind of cosmopolitanism was regarded by Asia and Africa without sympathy. In China, a concerted effort had been made to purge the foreign element from her culture. Its success, however, was only superficial. Pigtails and chopsticks had once more come into vogue among the leisured, and the study of Chinese classics was once more compulsory in all schools. Yet the manner of life of the average man remained American. Not only did he use American cutlery, shoes, gramophones, domestic labor-saving devices, but also his alphabet was European, his vocabulary was permeated by American slang, his newspapers and radio were American in manner, though anti-American in politics. He saw daily in his domestic television screen every phase of American private life and every American public event. Instead of opium and joss sticks, he affected cigarettes and chewing gum. You know, America indeed professed to have outgrown nationalism and stand for political and cultural world unity, but this unity was a unity under American organization, and by culture, she meant Americanism. Again, is there a more brilliant description of the American Empire, right? We're going to spread democracy, and by democracy, we mean the leaders in your country who have been democratically elected by the government of the United States. We're not winning, my friends. I don't care what Ben Stone tells you. We're not winning, okay? Women are becoming more and more worthless. The young people are becoming less and less interested in freedom. And people in college with 12 years of public education can't figure out what the fuck 21 minus 12 is. We are not winning. 